What is up guys, Media Review Mike here. Well ho 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 in a barrel of non-alcoholic sparkling apple juice because it seems to me like it's the most wonderful time of the year. The time of year that requires I give you all my thoughts on the Doctor Who Christmas specials. Last time I made a Doctor Who video, it performed super well, so it's only right that I give the topic another crack with a comprehensive ranking of all of the Doctor Who Christmas specials. Every year, pre-2018, long-running sci-fi series Doctor Who would air a Christmas special to celebrate the festivities, until Chris Chibnall came along and decided he was too cool for that and decided to ruin the tradition. In today's video, I will be ranking all 14 Doctor Who Christmas specials from worst to best based off of one, how Christmassy they are, and two, how good of a Doctor Who episode they are. I should note that I will not be including the New Year's special because those are not Christmas, and also Chris Chibnall's writing makes me want to drown myself. Merry Christmas, everyone! Do not cite the deep magic to me, witch. I was there when it was written. The Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe is one of the most forgettable and mind-numbing episodes of the Moffat era. Stephen Moffat as a writer is fairly hit or miss, and while I think he hits more than he misses, when he misses, he really misses. However, he is very rarely boring. The Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe is mind-numbingly boring. The Doctor plays Santa for a bunch of kids, and there are some tree people, I guess. There's some Save the Environment hoo-ha featuring a cute reference to the Caves of Androzani. And while the episode is undeniably Christmassy, it's boring as sin and sin is the last thing you want during a celebration of the birth of Christ. This episode opts to juggle an infuriatingly flanderized 11th Doctor going on a whimsical adventure into a magical forest with a story about grief and war, and also environmentalism? The story is confused and all over the place and has hardly anything to do with Narnia, especially seeing as Narnia is about the resurrection of Christ, not the birth of Christ, making it more of an Easter story than a Christmas one. This episode is very bad and cringe. Who never skips leg day? During 2016, Doctor Who went on hiatus, and this was the only episode that came out that year. Hiatus is a par for the course nowadays for Doctor Who, but this was much more uncommon back in 2016. So imagine the disappointment on my face after waiting a whole year for a new episode just to be given this piece of garbage. The return of Doctor Mysterio is a weird send-up of the 70s Superman movie with a thinly veiled Christmas setting to justify calling it a Christmas special. It centers around a kid with Superman's powers living a double life, and the Doctor is just kinda there. Your enjoyment of this episode likely hinges on how charming and nostalgic you find classic superhero flicks, a genre I have zero familiarity with. What it lacks in Christmas cheer, it doesn't exactly make up for in plot, but at least it's coherent. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. I'm kind of cheating by including this episode, considering it's the only Christmas special from the classic era and is also one part of a 12-part story. However, it's still technically a Christmas special and is therefore technically applicable to this list. I'm also being a bit of a sneaky little scamp by not putting this at the bottom because, frankly, it was terrible. However, I think it's too funny and charming to put any lower. It takes place in the middle of a very dark story about the Daleks and consists of the Doctor and crew landing on Earth at Christmas. The Doctor very rarely visits Earth in the 60s era so it was a fun change of pace. The police segment was funny, I imagine even more so with the original visuals. The animation I viewed by Adam Bullock certainly doesn't do the episode justice. That's not to say it's bad, it's just not the same. Then they go to a film set and the story just completely loses me and becomes a slog to sit through. However, the first Doctor and by extension William Hartnell is obviously having a lot of fun with the material, even breaking the fourth wall at the end, apparently unscripted, to wish the viewers at home a Merry Christmas. Extremely Christmas. Christmassy, if I do say so myself. This episode is objectively bad, but it's a charming piece of absurdist 60s slapstick. The previous episodes on this list don't have an excuse to be as bad as they are, but this one does, so it's fine. Do you marry me? Well, let's do it somewhere nicer than this. Bang. Okay, yes, I do. Yeah, she said yes. Okay, we finally move past the schlock and can now enjoy some decent specials. The Runaway Bride introduces us to fan-favorite companion Donna Noble, purposefully at her most unlikable. The Doctor is currently in his emo phase after losing Rose, so tonally this episode feels a tad confused. We go from a high-speed car chase with alien robots to the Doctor attempting to commit a mass genocide in the span of like 30 minutes. 
Donna is also pretty insufferable in this episode, but as I've already stated, that's by design. It's pretty heartbreaking watching this episode after knowing what happens to Donna in the end, knowing that all of that character development and growth she went through was completely wiped from her memory. For those of you from the future, as of writing this script, the 60th anniversary specials have yet to be released, and we don't know what Donna's role will be in it. So right now, the conclusion to her character was her getting married without any of the memories of her travels with the Doctor. Donna is arguably one of the best companions in the show's history, and while her introduction could have been a bit stronger, it does a solid job at characterizing her to really hit home how far she develops. I have mixed feelings on the snowmen. I really love the first two thirds of the story, with Victorian Clara being arguably preferable to modern Clara, at least with Eleven. I mean, can you imagine Twelve with a Cockney Victorian companion? The comedic potential in that concept is just... Mm. Palpable. However, I feel like this episode didn't really need the great intelligence in the story, and especially didn't need to waste the incomparable Richard E. Grant on such a worthless and forgettable character. The ending just loses me quite a bit, with the death of Cockney Clara and the rushed confrontation of the great intelligence letting the rest of the episode down. I think with some redrafting, this episode could have been a lot better. While it's pretty good by season 7B standards, it definitely suffers from the pitfall of Stephen Moffat's, we'll just say, inconsistent ability to write quality endings. Voyage of the Damned is a weird episode. It has a lot of potential with the concept of a Titanic in space, which obviously hits an asteroid and begins to crash, something that I guessed immediately would happen when I was like eight and watching the episode for the first time. However, it tries to juggle a packed cast of characters with character traits that boil down to old, douche, fat, alien, and Kylie Minogue trying to do a British accent. Astrid Peth has some pretty good chemistry with Ten. However, the ending was just, yeesh. Did Stephen Moffat write this? Fat lady character, I'm too lazy to Google their names. Going Adolf in bunker mode because her husband fell to his death was kind of dumb. The descent through the Titanic had some pretty cool moments, especially Ten's iconic speech. I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. I'm 903 years old and I'm the man who's gonna save your lives and all six billion people on the planet below. The Heavenly Hosts are a really cool design, but they look really cheap. They look like they're made out of Chinese takeout containers spray painted gold. Also, bro, this episode has hardly anything to do with Christmas. This is about as much a Christmas episode as Iron Man 3 is a Christmas movie. However, this episode does introduce Wilfred Mott, who is inarguably the best character in all of Doctor Who, and you cannot change my mind on that. God bless you, Bernard Cribbins. You may be gone, but you'll never be forgotten. Alright, if we're all done crying, let's move on to number... Are you The Christmas Invasion was the first Doctor Who Christmas special in 40 years when it came out, but it didn't exactly have much of a tough act to follow. The episode sees a freshly regenerated Ten having a wee kip throughout 80% of the episode, only showing up in the end to get into a sword fight with Sycorax. It's cute and all, but it's kind of weird to have your brand new Doctor be out of the story the whole time. But of course, that's said with the hindsight of knowing how regeneration works, something the average new fan wouldn't have known when watching the episode for the first time. So watching the companions go through the same confusion that the audience would have been going through totally makes sense. It's definitely Christmassy too. I mean, they nearly get killed by a Christmas tree at one point. That's hell Christmassy. And when the Doctor wakes up, he's immediately fantastic. Song for Ten is one of my favorite Murray Gold tracks, and while the episode doesn't have a whole lot going on, it definitely works. The ending with Harriet Jones killing the Sycorax and the Doctor basically destroying her career with six words was fantastic, and characterizes Ten fantastically. What a terrible work from very young age. The next Doctor is one of the best 40 minutes of Doctor Who to be let down by its last third. And thanks to Stephen Moffat, that's a pretty long list. I absolutely love this episode, at least for the most part. I definitely think that the episode would have benefited if the Cybermen took more of a backseat and didn't have Miss Hadigan and her Cybermech. The episode works a lot better as a character study of Jackson Lake than it does as a Cyberman story. I would change it, personally, so that all the Cybermen really do is kidnap his son and generally pose a threat to the town instead of building some cumbersome anime robot that just looks ridiculous. Hell, you could even have it so that the Cybermen were an allegory for the treatment of children in the factories at the time. Sure, the legislation on child labor laws changed before this episode takes place, but just shift the date back by like 30 years and that solves that problem. I don't know if that suggestion has ever been made. I literally thought of it while sitting through the footage I recorded of the episode like five minutes ago. Anyway, the episode 
episode is wonderfully Christmassy, being set in Victorian London. Gorgeous aesthetic, amazing character study, only really let down by its ending. Overall, a pretty great episode. <laughs> Don't shoot! I'm with the science team! Last Christmas is pretty underrated in my opinion. It's Doctor Who meets Inception, Playtest, and Half-Life. Oh, and Christmas, I guess. I firmly believe that Nick Frost was born to play Santa. I mean, are you kidding me? His name is literally Nick Frost. Amazing. This episode, unlike the next Doctor, actually takes time to be a character study instead of being a big monster bash. It's set at Christmas, but that isn't strictly the point of the story. It balances its aesthetics well, especially for an episode that literally has Santa Claus in it. It's heartbreaking, fun, and strangely nostalgic feeling. Not in the sense that I'm nostalgic for the episode itself, because I'm not, but the episode's focus on memories and grief is really poignant and executed extremely well. Also, that Half-Life comparison wasn't a joke, by the way. Literally. Look at these creatures. They are pound for pound the same. We need a new destination because I don't want to go. I was weighing up whether or not I should rank the end of time parts one and two separately or as one. I decided to rank them in one hit because you can't really watch one without watching the other, unlike Feast of Stephen, which even though it's part seven of a 12 part story, stands by itself. The end of time part one is an appalling dumpster fire with an insufferable master, a brooding doctor, and way too many plot points being juggled at once. Of course, it was elevated quite a bit by the presence of Wilf and the interactions between Ten and Wilf are the highlight, as well as the return of Gallifrey being foreshadowed. John Sims Master has never really been my favorite portrayal of the character. I think he's a bit too over the top at times, which kind of works in contrast to Tennant's Doctor, but words cannot express how annoying he is in this episode. Although he's not as bad as Sasha Dwan, uh... You eventually hit diminishing returns on the craziness to the point where it becomes Jared Leto's joke of levels of over the top and cringe. When it's toned down, like in the discussion of their childhood, it's great and shows promise. Then he starts screaming and shoots lightning out of his hands. I'm like a god in human clothing! Lightning bolt shoot from my fingertips! Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the skeleton thing yet. It's so dumb. The master does not need Emperor Palpatine lightning bolt fingers to be scary. Or flamboyant robes in Eric Roberts' face, but that's a different beast entirely and so is the master. However, everyone already knows this, just like how everyone already knows that part two is amazing and just barely saves this episode from being in the bottom half of this list. Now, I will concede 10's I Don't Wanna Go was pretty poorly timed and set Moffat and Matt Smith up in a pretty bad position going in, but everything else in this episode is amazing. The payoff of the he will knock four times prophecy is heartbreaking, and even though I've watched it a million times, 10's regeneration backed up by Vale de Kem always breaks me up emotionally. And 10 isn't even close to being one of my favorite favorite doctors. Like, I don't dislike him, but he also doesn't break the top five for me. If part one wasn't such a dumpster fire, this would be a lot higher up. But if part two weren't so phenomenal, then it would be a lot lower. So it balances out. <laughs> the Husbands of River Song is probably one of the saddest episodes in Doctor Who, and that's saying a lot. I'm not going to pretend it's super deep for the length of it, but 12 pretending not to know anything and waiting for River to realize who he is is pretty great. This episode is just so fun, and I don't get why people don't like it. The ending stands as one of my favorite in the show's 60-year history, and if you complain that it's ruined by a knight on Derillium being 24 years, then you can get Cole for Christmas. The chemistry between River and 12 is just better than between River and 11, if you ask me. Also, the episode? Very Christmassy. Even though Merry Christmas Everybody by Slade doesn't even play once which is apparently the only Christmas song that the BBC has rights to. I will always remember when the Doctor was me. Time of the Doctor has a pretty weak opening with the gratuitous nudity jokes making me want to swallow a .500 S&W Magnum. What's going on and how can I help? The gun, not the ice cream, which is a staple of not only Australian culture, but my family's Christmas feasts. I don't like pudding very much. I love pudding. <laughs> The episode does pick up immensely once they're on Trenzalore though, and the episode decides that Matt Smith leaving the show isn't depressing enough in itself, so decides to show him live to death, defending a town literally called Christmas. He defends Trenzalore for hundreds of years, and every time he sees Clara, he just gets older and older until he's completely crippled. Eleven's explanation of regeneration and him explaining the otherwise major plot hole of him being the 13th incarnation of the Doctor was amazingly done. And while I would have liked to see him regenerate properly instead of becoming young again and then regenerate with a single headbang, his final speech is just... <laughs> it all just disappears, doesn't it? Everything you are, gone in a moment, like breath 
on the mirror any moment now. He's a coming. Who's coming? The doctor. You. You are the doctor. Yep. And I always will be. But times change. And so must I. Why do all of these Christmas episodes have to be sad? Stop making me feel things. It's Christmas for goodness sake. The world has been gaslit into thinking that A Christmas Carol is the best Doctor Who Christmas special, which it isn't. However, it is still fantastic. I mean, for crying out loud, it's number two on a list that's basically just been me praising this British kids show. So it's probably doing something right. This is probably the best blend of sci-fi Christmas and homage to a classic novel in one episode of television. And while it isn't number one on this list, that's mainly due to my own biases. Funny how that works. People having opinions, crazy. What's there to say about A Christmas Carol that hasn't already been said? Its premise is fantastic. The Doctor has to serve Kazran's time stream in different stages of his life to try and make him into less of a complete arse, so he decides to save a bunch of people from crashing and dying. He does this through utilizing the power of teenage down baddiness. The episode is heartfelt, festive, and is only topped by an episode that just so happens to be my favorite in the entire show, so I mean... <laughs> Laugh hard. Run fast. Be kind. To understand why I decided to put this episode at number one on the list, I need to explain some context. Twelve is one of the few Doctors to have an obvious character arc throughout his run, where he develops from being cold, grumpy, and sometimes quite unlikable, to one of the kindest and most compassionate incarnations of the character. Twice Upon a Time is by far one of the most moving and interesting character dissections in the show's history, second only to Heaven Sent. I could go on for hours about why Heaven Sent is arguably the best episode in the show's history. However, Heaven Sent is less about the Doctor and more about his grief. Twice Upon a Time is about both. Doctor Who only tends to do multi-Doctor stories for the sake of fan service and in celebration of the show's history. However, Twice Upon a Time manages to do both of those things, while also having a powerful theme that would simply not work without David Bradley's portrayal of the first Doctor. This episode is basically a means of conveying to the audience a sense of, look how far we've come. The actual plot of the story isn't what makes the episode so good. The interactions between the first and twelfth Doctors are what makes it so great, especially the ending that takes place during the Christmas Armistice of 1914. The Doctors managed to save a random British soldier by slightly shifting the timeline to the day of the Christmas truce of World War I. This soldier turns out to be the father of Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. The Brigadier's father is a standout character in the story. It's his appearance that's what freezes time in the first place, and when he figures this out, he decides that he has to die to set things right. And this is all at a time where Twelve was ready to die because of all the people he'd lost. But they manage to save him. And this one small victory is what gives the Twelfth Doctor the motivation to keep going. Not enough people seem to appreciate that the Doctor was literally prepared to kill himself in order to stop losing the people he loved. But it takes a mix of saving the Brigadier's father and a reminder of all of the good he does in the universe, kicked on by the First Doctor, to remind him of the role that he plays in the universe. In his final moments before regeneration, he gives some advice to the Doctor to come, while Murray Gold's Shepherd's Boy theme plays, the same song that played during Twelve's escape from the confession dial in Heaven Sent. In that story, Twelve had to punch a wall of solid diamond over the course of 4.5 billion years, resetting himself by burning his body up and teleporting in a fresh version of himself, which I interpret as an allegory for regeneration and the repeating cycle of grief that the Doctor goes through. Now the song is recontextualized, with the Doctor breaking free from the shackles of his grief and loss, finding the will to live once again. Not only does it serve as a great ending for one of the best incarnations of the Doctor, but it also adds layers of context to the show's 60 year history. Are the jokes about the first Doctor being misogynistic cringeworthy? Yeah. Does the episode have flaws? Absolutely. But the 12th Doctor is my favourite incarnation of the character, and I could not have asked for a better ending for him. I understand that not everyone likes Twelve or Stephen Moffat, but they're two of my favourite creatives to ever have worked on the show, and their shared ending will go down as one of my favourite episodes of the show for what I imagine will be a very long time. Doctor. I let you go. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to leave a like and have a very Merry Christmas. This is Media Review Mike, signing out. Thank you.